grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> our text for this morning is the epistle reading, Philippians 2, 5-11. to Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here ends our text. Please be seated. <coughs> In Colossians 2, verse 9, it says, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. <clears throat> in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. Which, it's really kind of hard for me to get my head around the fact that God takes on flesh. And in this verse... For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. I, I can't wrap my head around it. I can't. But it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I'm going to quote a, a, an old dead theologian because we like to do that. Francis Pieper writes, In Christ, God and man are united in one person. The human nature of Christ created in the time appointed by God, was taken through the miraculous act of God into the person of the Son of God. The resulting wondrous and singular union of God and man into one person is called the personal union. This term clearly and unmistakably expresses the truth that in Christ, God and man do not form any kind of union in general, but constitute a personal union. Unity. <clears throat> wow. Okay. There's a union. God and man. Jesus. Peeper continued, If the Son of God is not merely a phantasm or a sham person, but a real man, possessing all human attributes, then, with his humanity, he has also the whole set of human attributes or everything which the human nature is, does, and undergoes. As, for instance, to be a creature, to be born in time, to suffer, to die, to rise again, to sit at the right hand of God, to return visibly, and the like. God becomes man. God takes on human flesh. <clears throat> Again, Peeper. If the Son of Man is God, not merely in name, but God in the essential, metaphysical sense of the term, then the Son of Man possesses with the divine nature also the whole set of divine attributes, such as eternity, divine power, divine knowledge, divine omnipresence, divine glory, and so forth. What we need to try to get our heads around is the fact that this Jesus, born of the Virgin Mary, is God. And when we look at our text, and it says that he, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Don't think for a minute that he emptied himself of one of his divine attributes. Now see, I could suffer a terrible accident and lose an arm. And that would be a terrible accident. But I would still be me. I would still be me. I would be less than arm, but I would still be me. You can't take away one of the attributes of God and then still have God. You can't take away his omnipresence, which means he's everywhere. You can't take that away and say, oh yeah, he's still God, he's just not omnipresent. You can't take away his all-powerfulness, his omnipotence, 
You can't take that away and say, oh, he's God, he's just not all powerful anymore. You can't take away his omniscience, the fact that he knows everything. You can't take that away and say, oh, yeah, he's still God, he just doesn't know anything anymore. You can't do it. They're not little bits and pieces, these attributes of God. We talk about God that way because we have to get our head around just who and what God is. We don't do it completely, but it's a start. You can't take out a piece of God and still have him be God. He's God. Because he is immutable. A fancy way of saying he can't change. He can't change. So you can't take away his omnipotence or his omnipresence or his omniscience. You can't take away one of those attributes of God and still have God. And yet here the scripture clearly tells us In him, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So God is still God. And that's Jesus. The God-man. The God-man. So when our text says he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, well, what does it mean? The humiliation and exaltation of Christ deal with Christ's human nature. The divine nature can neither undergo humiliation nor exaltation. See, there's two natures in Christ. But one person. Perfect harmony. Perfect God-man. And it's, that's tough to understand. But we see the beauty of it in all the things he did and who he was and the words that he spoke, the loving way he lived, how giving he was. The human nature that Christ assumed was made partaker of all that belonged to his divine nature. It's a good fit. It's a perfect fit. in Jesus. And one biblical commentator writes, although all this glory dwelt in his human nature, he used it only to the degree that was needed for his office. Jesus didn't exercise all of his divine I want to say powers. I think I've seen too many comic books made into movies. He didn't use all of his divine powers all the time. He didn't use them. The same commentator writes, he emptied himself is an incomplete thought, which leaves us with a question. Paul completes the thought, yet not by a statement regarding anything that Christ emptied out of himself, but by a participle. That's, those are those verbs that have ing at the end that defines the act of emptying himself, in that he took slave's form. And it once adds, when all these acts took place, when he got to be in men's likeness, when he became incarnate. All the eris, those past tense verbs that I used the word punctiliar a while ago and got called a bit on it. But punctiliar means a, a, a point, a point in time. It's punctiliar. All these verbs, they're punctiliar. Historical expressing simultaneous action. All are predicated of the God-man Christ Jesus. This is something Jesus did at a point in time. He humbled himself. He humbled himself. He emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He did that. Stepped into our history. So let's pretend. <coughs> let's pretend. <coughs> There's a battle raging. And the king calls his warriors. And he calls them to dress for battle. To gird on their sword. To stand tall. There's a fight. You're fighting for a king. 
You're fighting for country. You're fighting for the safety of your families, your little children, your beloved wives. Stand up. Put on that sword. Are those who enter that call no longer men? In those days, it was just men who girded on the swords and went to fight. Are they no longer men? It's a pretend story anyway. Because they girded on a sword, are they no longer men? Of course not. They're men who are dressed for battle. They're men who are ready to fight. They're men who are going, they're willing to go out and bleed and die to protect their homeland, to protect their families, to protect their children. Are these men still warriors even though they strapped on a sword? It's kind of an odd question, isn't it? But you see, Christ heads in the opposite direction to fight the battle. It's like he takes off the sword. He takes on the form of a slave. He becomes obedient to the point of death even death on a cross. Does that somehow make him less God? Because his way of doing battle seems to go against our logic. What's the norm? He does battle by emptying himself, emptying himself and taking on the form of a servant, a slave. We have to use the term slave here because slaves were executed on crosses. So he goes and takes on the form of a slave so that he could be executed on a cross the way slaves are executed. But this is the way the incarnate Son of God does battle. He doesn't give up being God. He doesn't toss off some of his divine attributes as if they were things to be shedded. But he empties himself. He doesn't use. He chooses to not use what you and I would probably use if we were faced with people who are going to arrest us and nail us to a cross. He's still God. But this is what he chose to do. He chose to humble himself. And he chose the form of a slave so that he could die. He empties himself by lowering himself, by humiliating himself. He had to be God to engage in the battle, to be obedient <clears throat> to this call to suffer and die. As the mighty God, he conquers death by his death and raises up the temple of his body. It's not just another man who goes to that cross on that first Good Friday. It's the God-man. It's Jesus. His death counts for something. He's God and he's innocent. And by dying, he conquers death. The first man was from the earth, so writes Paul to the church at Corinth. A man of dust. The second man is from heaven. He is that second Adam. He's the one who comes and fixes all that's been broken for so long. He restores the human race by forgiving us all of our sins through his shed blood. Takes on the role of a slave and bleeds and dies. Here's the point. He was... The Son of God, equal with God. He communicated divine attributes to his human nature, for in him the fullness of deity dwells bodily. 
He died hanging on a cross. He died as one accursed, hanging on wood, the sign of being accursed. Luther has well said, if I permit myself to be persuaded that only the human nature has suffered for me, then Christ is to me a poor Savior. Then he himself, indeed, needs a Savior. Christ, true God, true man, suffered for you. Still God, suffered for you. This is like a whole bunch of theology in this little section of Philippians, and it's interesting that Paul starts off this segment with, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. He's holding up Christ, who abases himself. Paul's holding up Christ, who abases himself, as an example for us to follow. How can we ever follow that example? Very simply, by using all that we have, all that God has given us, for the benefit of others. That's the big idea that Paul's trying to convey in that little preface. Let this attitude be in you. That was in Christ. Look at who and what he is and what he did for the benefit of others. Take what you have, what you are, and use it for the benefit of others. Christ is the perfect example. The perfect example of how to live with everything that God has given us how to live. It's a daunting task. And in essence, impossible to fulfill completely. And yet Paul puts that out there for us. If you're going to emulate someone, (laughs) if you want a role model, Paul says, there you have him. God in the flesh dying for all. That's our hope. That's our peace. Amen. Please stand. Now may the peace of God, which passes all of our human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.